just the overall uh, environment, and I, I mean globally in terms of growth and, and just the the, um, the environment for equities and in investing right now after we've come back so sharply from the December lows. Well, if you want to talk globally, I think we're seeing some divergences. Uh, the environment for equities um, and growth looks stronger at this point in the U.S. than in Europe, where who knows? Uh, you know, they're 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 trying to fight off the coming of a potential recession. Um, in the U.S., um, we're continuing to see growth. Earnings momentum looks stronger. So, in terms of markets, we have a more positive outlook here than some other places in the world. And then let's talk about it. Here, what 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 do you see for 2019, remainder of the year, and then and then in 2020 for the U.S.? Well, when we're thinking about forecasting the markets, we're looking at a few things. One is what's happening in the economic and monetary policy environment. It's great that the inflation outlook is at bay. Um, it's a positive that interest rates have actually been falling so far this year. That's a positive catalyst for stocks um, where the yield can look more attractive than bonds. Uh, earnings momentum, as I said, is strong. Uh, the two things that we see as potential headwinds are, of course, valuation. Uh, it's an ongoing conversation. Um, and investor sentiment. You know, when investors become very bullish, and we have seen uh, investors uh, being very risk-seeking so far this year, what that means is that there are fewer and fewer buyers on the sidelines remaining to continue to push the market upward. I will say that we're not seeing bullishness at the levels that we saw back in October before the big correction. Mm. Is there, do you have, a, you have a bias towards value stocks? Uh, there's a big, uh, I would say there's a big debate now between value and growth. And what's your, what's your thinking there? I mean, it's, it, people keep waiting for value to do better, but it's hard, it's hard not to see value doing better without the banks in particular doing better. So mm -hmm. we really try to blend value indicators in our forecasting process along with other things that are uncorrelated with value, like momentum. So that when you get into an environment like the one that we've seen, uh, not only this year, um, but value at this point has actually underperformed growth for a period of 10 years or more. Um, so when you blend signals that offer negatively correlated information, it can provide more stability um, for your returns. But you're right, we actually have a tool that helps us to forecast the forward-looking environment for value to do well. And recently, we've started to see it pick up. The reason that this is important is that, you know, I did mention that we're in a really big drawdown for value in a long one. But if you look at the historical data, what you'll see is that the strongest periods of value tend to immediately follow the weakest. And so you don't want to stay out of value until it's too late. What we're doing at Materan is starting to increase the emphasis that we have on value in our portfolios. And we always keep some emphasis in it at all times. I mean, rates have come down, but it, like it, it's always uh, a worry about what the reason is. I, I mean, if, if we're tethered to the rest of the world, I can see that might not be bearish. But, but, if, it, but if it's like coming it's down to the Fed's comments, not necessarily any. I don't know if the 10 year economic. is as much. I think the 10 year is more tied to Germany and, and their bonds and, and more tied to our growth outlook. Is it, I mean, it, shouldn't it be a negative for growth if rates stay low? Well, it, you have to think about how it affects investor sentiment. Uh, when interest rates are low, it but forces are they low? investors to try to find returns no, and yield in other places. But is it and I signaling think that's a, a slowdown? Part of what's driven the growth trade for some time. No, but is, is it signaling, signaling a slowdown? Or is it just signaling that the, the central banks are or, artificially? Well, look at the, the Fed themselves have stuff. changed their tune, right? right. Uh, the expectation for the path of interest rates is very different now than it was this time last year. Right. I, I, I agree with you has. that there's uh, that in there's pressure, pressure on the 10-year yield coming from foreign right. buyers, right. but that differential, um, the, you know, they've had negative interest rates in Europe for some time now. Right. So I don't think that that's the big thing that's changed. And I, I think it looked like we were going to break free from that, and then all of a sudden the Fed said no go. Mm -hmm. So we're still tethered. I think we're tethered. Yeah. The market is rightly listening to what the Fed is doing. Another thing that I think has happened is that under the Powell Fed, that the effectiveness of communications has gotten better. You know, at first there was some choppiness and confusion, and we're going into the big Fed announcement on Wednesday, and it seems to me that we all many know what's coming. exactly, yeah. uh, and that's a sign of success. And I think we're also seeing that in the rates themselves. 
So you would, at this point, tell clients to be um, overweight stocks in the United States. Any, and, and then how do you, as far as an asset mix, how do you get some type of less volatile uh, portion of, of their, uh, you know, with, with bonds so on, or I don't know, do you think they're still attractive because they're not going high, because uh, interest rates aren't going higher, or do you just go 100% yeah. in the stock? Our, our forecast for bonds is also favorable, largely because of the inflation environment. Um, you know, it, it's, it's been hard for central banks around the world to, to percolate inflation. Yeah. Uh, we're still under the 2% the target slightly if you look at the Fed's PCE number. And so as long as inflation remains at bay, interest rates can stay low. But if investors are thinking about how to build a portfolio that will be more resilient, another thing that they can do is look at the types of stocks that they're buying. You know, not just to focus on the highest flying, uh, most volatile, highest beta stocks, which beta, by the way, is the single indicator that's been the most successful at forecasting stock prices so far this year, but instead really to think about blending in um, lower volatility, more conservative choices uh, into the equity portfolio itself. Do you have a strong opinion about FANG at this point? No, I just find it so interesting that market participants continue to focus on FANG as a group, and I think it's a strong sign of uh, how sentiment and behavior drives our way of thinking about stocks at this moment. It's true that the FANG stocks are very popular, they're highly traded, they're high beta, but if you were to actually look at the fundamentals of the stocks, you'd see that they're already very different. Uh, we're talking about valuation. Look at Netflix trading at 90 times 2019 forecasted earnings, Amazon at 60, where you've got Apple all the way down at 15. And so the, the fact that we talk about FANG as a group signals to me that in a way we're not really looking at and talking about fundamentals. Right.